Good morning. Welcome to day two. I think most of our majors and minors have to do with our, our really quality sort of um, kitsch that we make <laughs> for the department, such as water bottles that say, quoting John 4, he who drinks this water will be thirsty again. <laughs> or our coffee mugs from Hebrews 6.2, so that you may not be sluggish. Right? And I'm currently working on like a full body like onesie that says his garment was woven in one piece from top to bottom. So <laughs> yes, yes. I That's right. I'm, you know, you're in town, so I might ask you to come and wear it. You could be like the little <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Get you and John both. It'd be great. Anyway, so... As Jess said, thank you, Jess. Um, actually, first off, uh, so I know all of you are involved in catechesis. Thank you, like sincerely, thank you. Um, I've got, as Jess said, four children, who are six, four, two, and zero. I mean, not zero, but you know what I mean. Um, and the the oldest two are in, in Good Shepherd at our local parish at St. Matthew, and I see firsthand um, how beautiful and how formative that that catechesis can be. We had a, an open session, you know, at the end of the year. And my two-year-old came as well. He just made a giant train of all the sheep. It was a choo-choo. <laughs> and then knocked him over. Anyway, so he's not quite ready, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get to him. We'll get to him soon. Anyhow, so this morning I'd like to turn our attention to Scripture to see in what way we might enrich our understanding of the Eucharist. And taking our cue from the connection that the liturgy itself makes, I thought we might look first at the way in which the Old Testament prefigures the Eucharist by providing us with a series of types. Secondly, I'd like to turn our attention not to the types themselves, not to these individual moments of correspondence between the new and the old, but to the very fact that we have types at all. I'll suggest that the individual types that we see surface in the New Testament and in the writings of the church and in its liturgy are indicative of a more fundamental reality, namely that the whole of the Old Testament and of the history about which it speaks, is, as it were, a type of what takes place in the Eucharist. That's to say, if we view the Eucharist as the fulfillment of history of the Old Testament, it's not because it recapitulates individual moments in the Old Testament, individual images or instances, but quite simply just because the whole Old Testament and the whole of history draws to a head a narrative which is itself Eucharistic in shape. Right? The whole of history has a Eucharistic form. And so you could say, well, of course, certain images and certain instances of this are going to kind of percolate before the real thing comes about. Again, not because God is hiding clues along the way, but because the entire shape of the narrative of the Old Testament of history is Eucharistic. And so it's going to bubble up and show itself along the way to the reality. Okay. Um, just by the way, this is an image I always love. You can see the, the priest holding up the Eucharist. It's actually a little Jesus. Um, this is from the, uh, the cathedral in Orvieto, which is where the, 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 the corporal um, has a little blood stain on it, is housed, so not too far outside of Rome. And this is where Aquinas, Orvieto was the center of what well, had a major library um, of the fathers. And so when someone like Aquinas had the opportunity to read the fathers, he came to Orvieto to use their library. And it was here that Aquinas authored the, um, the uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? The Corpus Christi, Tanto Mergo, the whole office of Corpus Christi. Yeah, so, and of course, not unrelated to the Eucharistic miracle that took place there, the miracle of Bolsena. Bolsena is a town nearby, but the, the, um, the, the corporal, the relic, is housed in, in Orvieto. So that's, that's just for jeopardy. You know, that's not part of the presentation. Okay. So just to take our cue from, from the liturgy itself, as you know, we've got four Eucharistic prayers, one of which wasn't written the night before in, in a trattoria in Rome. <laughs> if you're ever curious about Eucharistic prayers two through four, which I love, they, and how sort of quickly they were drummed up, um, you should check out the, the memoirs of Father Louis Bouillet, uh, who authored one of the Eucharistic prayers, literally, at a trattoria in, in Trastevere in Rome the night before it was due. <laughs> I mean, the Holy Spirit works in strange ways. Anyway. Um, but the Roman canon goes back to the earliest centuries, and I just take it as our cue for the talk because it mentions a, a few of the types that we will talk about. So therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of your blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. 
Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, to accept them as you were pleased to accept the gift of your servant Abel, the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. And maybe the first thing to notice is that in calling to our attention Abel, Abraham, and Melchizedek, I think with the author of the Roman canon, is not just sort of gratuitously pointing to a couple places in scripture where, hey, that, there's bread and wine there too, or oh, there's a sacrifice over there, right? Um, he's obviously doing something much deeper, which is to say that tradition or that, that whole, yeah, the whole tradition of sacrifice, um, which leads up to the Eucharist, is in a way an anticipation of it, a prefigurement of it, participation in it. And so not just, hey, like there was bread and wine there, except this bread and wine and make it the Eucharist, but in keeping with the whole trajectory that we've been living over these centuries, except also now this sacrifice, which is like these others which have come before. Um, before we talk about some of the individual types, here's a stab at maybe a way we can understand the type. The Bible, thankfully, doesn't have footnotes. Um, it wouldn't be too exciting if it did. Uh, it's full, of course, of quotations, of citations, I'm sorry, citations, allusions, echoes, all these different categories whereby it uses the Old Testament. And here maybe is what it's doing by referencing the Old. Here we go. The words and deeds at each moment in sacred history bear an intrinsic and revelatory relation to others, both before and after. That's an important point. An occurrence on earth, writes Eric Auerbach, signifies not only itself, but at the same time another, which it predicts or confirms, without prejudice to the power of its concrete reality here and now. I'll explain that line. That's to say, each moment of history is bound within a coherent, mass providential master narrative and is mutually illuminative of other moments and is illumined by other moments. In moving chronologically, earlier events serve as types of what is to come. So again, if we think of the whole of salvation history and of the Old Testament, which speaks of that as one providentially structured narrative, again, of course it's going to be the case that earlier moments prefigure and allude, not allude to, prefigure and point us in the direction of what will later come to be. What Auerbach means when he says, um, without prejudice to the power of its concrete reality here and now, he means this, just to take one example. Um, St. Paul will refer to the passing through the Red Sea as a type of baptism, right? The passage through the Red Sea isn't just a literary fiction, just some little thing, like a little clue written into what was going to happen later, but was itself a real historical event, right? So it was a real thing and also something which prefigures something later on. That's what Auerbach means when he says, without prejudice to the power of its concrete reality here and now. So, so that's maybe a, a working definition of what we mean by a type. Earlier things in the master narrative of providence that prefigure later things. And so we could say the types are words and deeds that announce what is to come. And, and I think this is the more important half, given what Jess said and given what you heard from Tim last night. Types, are, types provide the larger structure within which to understand what is to come. Let me make a little detour here. One of the things that typifies the no pun intended type. One of the things that typifies the New Testament's use of the old is what we call deferral. Um, Isaiah is quoted left and right. Uh, the Psalms are everywhere. But sometimes it says, you know, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, and then you have a quotation mark and the whole thing. More often than not, you have just a passing word or passing image, or th probably the best example would be the words of Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which, of course, are the opening words of the psalm. What is Christ doing? Well, in, in announcing or in saying those words, he is, as it were, directing his audience to consider the whole of what that psalm contains, right? He's deferring to the psalm and what it reveals. So it's as if Christ is saying, if you would understand what's happening right now, go back and read. This earlier event provides the larger structure within which to understand what is 
in the case of the crucifixion, happening now, right? So these moments of, of typology, these moments of illusion or echo of things in the Old Testament aren't just little garnishes on what is a, com a complete whole in the new. They're pointers to go back and consider these earlier realities so as to better understand the crucifixion, or in our case today, the Eucharist, and so on. So these earlier types taken together form this whole sort of imaginative um, framework within which we can think about the reality of the Eucharist, its meaning, and so on. Okay. So they provide the larger structure within which to understand what's to come. Okay. If, therefore, we find, I'm promised not, the whole talk is not written out in quotes on PowerPoint, but just a couple. If, therefore, we find Eucharistic types in the Old Testament, it's not because God in his providence has desired to supply us with sudden, subtle and hidden clues like a treasure hunt, but because, again, the whole of creation is Eucharistic in shape and reveals itself as such through the course of God's dealings with Israel. All right. Um, just to echo this point, it's always good to have Augustine at your back. Um, here's something from Augustine's um, on catechizing the uninstructed. He writes, And in truth, for no other reason were all of those things which we read in the Holy Scriptures written, previous to the Lord's advent, but for this. Namely, that his advent might be pressed upon the attention, and that the church which was to be should be intimated beforehand. So just a little endorsement of the typological reading. And just for fun, um, Aquinas, I mean, sorry, Augustine has this beautiful way of uh, reconciling the fact that you have language about Christ, images about Christ before Christ. But Christ is the head, so it seems like he should come first, right? So he said, you know, Christ is the head of the body. And, well, when you have a birth, the head comes out first. But maybe we... <laughs> breach. Scripture is breach. No. Um, <laughs> Augustine says, if you want to think about typology, maybe we can remember the birth of Jacob, uh, who's, who's born but we, you know, with his hand out first. And so he says, those things which are united to Christ below the head, because Christ is the head of the body, precede Christ and announce its coming. That's just a fun little image. So he writes, for although the hand may be put forward away before the head, still it has its connection beneath the head. Wherefore, all things which were written aforetime were written in order that we might be taught thereby, and were our figures, and happened in a figure of the case of these men, of Jacob. Moreover, they were written for our sakes, upon whom, as he's quoting Paul here in Corinthians, upon whom the end of the ages has come. Okay, so just a little endorsement from Augustine about typology. And here, uh, this is paragraph, I forgot to put it, 1334 from the Catechism. And I gave you, of course, Cardinal Ratzinger, who's the general editor and author of much of the Catechism. Hmm? I, I said, you remember off the top of your head, 1334. Oh, I just... You have memorized <laughs> the whole thing. Uh, yeah, of course, of course. No. <laughs> um, no, I stuck the slide in this morning, so it's fresh in my memory. <laughs> I have no idea what's in 1333 or 1335. No. This is the whole section on the Eucharist, but this is the one little paragraph that pulls out some of the Old Testament types. But what I want you to notice in the way that this, uh, this paragraph is written is the fact that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger or the Catechism aren't just alerting us of individual moments of typology, but in doing so, it, it, the Catechism is presenting the deeper narrative of which these types are a part. So, in the Old Covenant, bread and wine, and I, I put in bold the individual types that we see in the New. In the Old Covenant, bread and wine were offered in sacrifice among the first fruits of the earth as a sign of acknowledgement to the Creator. But they also received a new significance in the context of the Exodus, the unleavened bread, that is, that Israel eats every year at Passover, commemorates the haste of the departure that liberated them from Egypt. The remembrance of the manna in the desert will always recall to Israel that it lives by the bread of the word of God. Their daily bread is the fruit of the promised land, the pledge of God's faithfulness to his promises. The cup of blessing at the end of the Jewish Passover meal adds to the festive joy of wine an eschatological dimension, the messianic expectation of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. When Jesus instituted the Eucharist, he gave a new and definitive meaning to the blessing of the bread and of the cup. So here's what I mean by putting forward, or putting up this, uh, this article from the, this paragraph from the Catechism. This isn't just a laundry list. Like, here's how I would write a really sad catechism. Like, we use bread and wine in the Eucharist. Melchizedek used bread and wine. The bread and wine is our nourishment on a journey. 
manna was a nourishment on the journey. Like these are just like connect the dots. What the catechism is doing here is sowing these different things, bread and wine, unleavened bread, Passover, sowing it together into the whole narrative of the Old Testament, such that when all of these elements are taken up in the Eucharist, you see that they are a furthering of and a completion of this whole ongoing narrative of the Old, right? So again, it's not just a surface level correspondence, but a much, much more robust and deeper correspondence. All right. Now, let me say this also. Christianity is weird, um, like lovely weird. Uh, and I mean that not at all in, in a disrespectful way. Um, think of the challenge that the Apostle Paul had in presenting the faith, right? Eventually, as you hear at the beginning of Corinthians, he says, you know, the wisdom of God is wiser than the foolish, or the foolishness of God is wiser than the, the wisdom of men. And I preach to you only Christ crucified. This is a really hard package to sell, right? And in some cases, Paul, both to assert the, the antiquity or to the origin of his gospel, but also to say, like, I didn't make this up. You have Paul saying things like here in 1 Corinthians, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, which is to say, I didn't make this up. It's what I'm about to say, I didn't make it up. And then you have the announcement of, in this case, the resurrection. But notice what Paul does, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. It's also in our creed, right? And that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. So what Paul's going to do here in this, this little catechesis on the resurrection is say this seemingly unintelligible and certainly unexpected event is both anticipated, right, in accordance with the scriptures, and is made intelligible by what has come before. I'll say that again. Think of the two things we said that types do. They announce ahead of time, and they provide you the context within which to understand what comes later. This is what Paul is saying. What I'm about to tell you was announced ahead of time, and it's within the context of these earlier things that we'll be able to find an intelligibility of the resurrection, of the passion, and so on. So you have the New Testament deferring to the Old not just pointing us back to surface level correspondences, but deferring to the old, to consider, consider the old narrative so as to understand the things that are now happening. All right. Okay. So with that kind of like brief introduction to what typology is and how it works, I thought maybe we could look at, I have, I have four in the presentation, we'll see if we get to them all, but four instances in the New Testament where we're speaking about the Eucharist, or at least about the passion, which of course are synonymous. Um, and where you have, in this case, Paul, in the latter three cases, um, St. John in his gospel, pointing us back to moments in the old so as to provide some sort of intelligibility to the Eucharist, to the passion. So from 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same supernatural food and drank the same supernatural drink. For they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. We'll get back to that. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things are warnings for us, not to desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. And then skipping ahead, therefore, my beloved, shun the worship of idols. I speak as sensible men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the, spiritual, the sacrifices partners in the altar? You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Okay, there's about 15 things in here I want to pull out and talk about. Here's what I have in mind in sharing this passage with you. Paul doesn't just say, as was my example with writing a sad catechism, look, the thing we do now, it's like Melchizedek. There's bread and wine. Not, he's not pointing to just those surface level correspondences. 
Paul's calling to mind, <coughs> in this case, the whole narrative of the Exodus and saying to the Corinthians, what you are now experiencing or undergoing is fundamentally, is analogous to, is a recapitulation of that earlier struggle and unlike them, don't screw it up. Um, he doesn't quite, that's in the Greek. <laughs> um, but let's look at the way he does it, the way that uh, Woody pulls into this conversation. Okay, so obviously he's talking about the passage through the sea out of Egypt, right? He's reading that passage as a type of baptism. First Corinthians is a very sacramental letter. You have baptism and Eucharist all over. And he's recalling to mind the supernatural food, which is, of course, the manna in the wilderness. And then this is fun. Uh, what's the supernatural drink? Yeah, okay, water from the rock. And, you know, like most of the rocks in my yard stay put. But what, <laughs> which followed them? And the rock was Christ. You look at the second half of verse 4. The supernatural rock which followed. There's a, there's a rabbinic tradition um, that the rock which gave forth water um, journeyed with the Israelites on their way to the promised land. And all the way to the site of what is the Temple Mount and becomes the foundation stone of the temple. Again, this is not sort of part of the deposit of faith. You don't have to believe. It's just a nice rabbinic tradition. Um, it's, it, but it's, it's, a, it's a tradition that wonderfully sews together a lot of the imagery um, of the Old Testament. So here's why. Do I want to do this now? Yeah, okay. Um, have you been to Jerusalem? Many of you? Okay, there's a, what's the little stream that comes out? Uh, remember the name? You can walk through it in Hezekiah's Tunnel. The Gihon Stream. Yeah, like stream is a compliment. It's like trickle, right? It's, but in calling it, or even a river, um, you're doing what's called like, like a spiritual geography. Because where else, if you remember, where else does the Gihon show up in Scripture? In the Garden of Eden, right? And so what Israel's doing is they're identifying the temple with Eden. And I know this is a bit of digression, but it's worthwhile. We'll come, come back into our talk later. Uh, think of the, the burning bush, the moment of theophany in Exodus 3. I like to ask my, my students, if you had the opportunity to appear as in any way you wanted, you are the Lord God Almighty, how are you going to appear? Like burning shrub is not normally in the top ten, right? Like there, there are more impressive ways to like take the stage, right? I said, well, okay, well, why, why would God choose this imagery? Why would he appear in a, a tree that's burning but not good? And I said, well, think back. When's the last time you saw trees? And we've only read Genesis at this point in our class. And they said, oh, Eden. I said, well, how did we leave Eden? Oh, it was kind of, oh, it was surrounded by fire. Or there was at least fire at the gate, the flaming sword of the chair. We're like, oh, so Eden, the site of God's presence, bounded by fire. And the man and the woman are kicked out. And then you have, as it were, sort of Eden sneaking along back into the, <laughs> into the desert, like Moses. It's like Eden, it's God pursuing the human person again, right? Like, oh, this is the divine trying to reestablish communion. So what happens to the burning bush? I don't know. But how is it memorialized? <laughs> you know? It becomes the singing bush of the three amigos. Never mind, sir. That's terrible. That's, terrible. Um, <laughs> that's terrible. Uh, but if you think, one of the things that's, the, the first thing created in the tabernacle narrative in Exodus, so Exodus 25 and following, is of course the menorah, right? And the menorah is carved to look like a flowering almond tree, and it's set on fire. It's, it's a flaming bush, it's a flaming tree. And by the way, the word for, the, um, the word for uh, bush in Exodus 3, sene, is, it's, it could bush, small tree, it's kind of an ambiguous word. And it's meant to sound like Sinai, Sene. That's, that's a whole other story. So you have Eden, then the burning bush, then the menorah. And so where do you put the menorah? Within the tabernacle, right? The mobile sanctuary, which becomes over time the temple. And so here you have something, which is the site of God's presence, as symbolized by the menorah, which is to say the burning bush. Oh, this is the new Eden. And look. Even out of this temple, out of this new site, flows one of the original rivers of Eden, the Gihon. As if to say, here is the site of God's presence with men. Here is the site from which all blessings flow. Right, so this whole wonderful connection of imagery. 
And um, anyway, that's one of the things that the water from the rock and the journey of the rock calls to mind. I promise we'll come back to that. That wasn't strictly gratuitous. Okay, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, here we've got to dig back a little bit into the book of Numbers, which I know you all read nightly. It's a joke. Um, do you remember the, the last moment of rebellion at the end of Moses' life before, they, um, before Joshua crosses over into the land? It's, this, it's in Numbers 25. It's, it's the sin of Baal Peor. Um, here's your brief summary. While Israel dwelt in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Notice here what the function of eating is. Israel begins to mix with Moab. They end up at the Moabite feasts, and through what they do bodily, through their consumption of the at the table of, of Baal, of this site, Peor, so Baal of Peor, through the consumption of that meal, they yoke themselves to Baal. A running theme in Corinthians is that what you do with the body matters greatly. Like in chapter 7, he's talking about sort of sexual immorality and joining yourself to, the, to a prostitute. Don't you know that you become a member of the prostitute when you join yourself to her? In this case, kind of a cultic prostitute, so you're separating yourself from God and joining the table of another God. And in calling to mind this moment of Israel's history, saying, hey, just as now we have a table with our God, is not the bread we break, is not the blessed cup of blessing we share, right? Just as now we have a table with our God, so recall that Israel, though they were so close to the promised land, chose to share on the table of Baal of Peor rather than of Yahweh. And so this is why Paul can say in verse 6, now these, I'm sorry, in, in verse 5, nevertheless with most of them God was not pleased. And you recall, according to Numbers, that whole generation dies in the, in the wilderness. They were overthrown in the wilderness. And so what Paul is pointing us to is not just, again, this surface level typology between bread and wine or, you know, manna and the Eucharist, but saying, listen, this whole history of having the opportunity to sit down at table with God, which we squandered in the wilderness when we fell victim at Baal Peor, that opportunity, that invitation to table is again open to us. And so you know what? You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons of Baal Peor or whoever else it is. Sit down at the right table. Right? And what Paul is doing by calling to mind this image is teaching us something about the function of the Eucharist. Here is the meal which we share. What does it do? Right? But it, it yokes us to Christ in the same way that this failed meal yokes us to Baal of Peor. Creates a general, uh, an actual unity with Christ. This is why we're one body, right? In verse 17, we who are many are one body. So Paul, in calling to mind these images of the old, isn't just pointing to earlier images, but he's pointing and teaching us about the significance of the Eucharist. Here is the meal given to us by Christ by which full unity with Christ is achieved, right? Just as they pass through the water, like we pass through baptism and we're fed with manna and we're joined to God, but then squandered it, so you have passed through baptism and have the table of the Eucharist. Don't eat of anything else. You cannot be partaker of the table of the Lord, the cup of the Lord, and anything else. Don't provoke the Lord to jealousy. Okay, I know that's, that's a lot, but my point is, notice how the Old Testament forms the sort of imaginative context, so we're, wherein we can understand the Eucharist. What does the Eucharist do? What is it? Oh, it's exactly like the meal at Baal Peor, or it's exactly like the covenant meal at Sinai. It's something that allows us to be yoked to, to be joined to, to enter intimacy with the God who offers the meal. Right? So this is a deeper level catechesis that begins from pointing out surface level correspondences, but then goes goes much deeper. So that's one example from Paul. Let me give you one example from, from John as well. Here we go. Nope. You got your double L Greco, by the way. That's just little Paul L Greco, John L Greco. Anyway, I'm not sure I like that one. But. Well, I mean, this is, 
I don't want to fight with any of you, but this was like John of Patmos. This is the author of Revelation. Like, I'm of the minority opinion that he wrote the gospel as well, but anyway, mo most people aren't. Anyway. Okay, so quoting from the Gospel of John. Uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, full of grace and truth. We've beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, and from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now before we get to chapter 6 there in the next paragraph, obviously the bread of life discourse, I want, just, I want us to see the way that John, from the get-go, is calling to mind the entire Old Testament narrative. So how does the Gospel of John begin? It's not quoted there. But in the beginning, which of course is the way that Genesis begins. John is giving us a new version of a creation story, right? In the beginning. And what's with this line, of course, which we all know and we repeat in the Angelus, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. There's, there's, a, there's occasionally like, you know, little moments in scripture where the original language makes a great deal of difference. This happens to be one. Um, the word for be, uh, dwelt amongst us is eskenosen, which skenos is a tent. So literally it means, and the word became flesh and pitched his tabernacle among us. And in using that imagery, of course, John is pointing us back to God's dwelling with Israel in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And I'll show you something else from Sirach 24. But John is saying, just as it once happened then, so it happens now. He's grafting everything he's going to say about Christ onto the Old Testament, onto Genesis 1, onto the Exodus narrative, and so on. And then, skipping again to verse 16, from his fullness, from Christ's fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And then, this is going to sound like a really nerdy question. Notice the semicolon. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. How are those two halves of the sentence connected? Like, this is really important for the way we read the whole of John. Is it contrastive? Like, yesterday I ate Zbaro, but today I had real Italian food, right? Um, if you don't know bar, Zbaro, it's otherwise known as Zbarfo. Um, so, but like, it's bad thing and then good thing. Or if you followed some of the Renaissance polemic, uh, not, uh, Reformation polemic, you'd have this opposition between law and gospel, right? This is not what John, John says, no, we received grace upon grace. Like, what was already a grace has been capped with another. It's like a two-layer cake, right? For the law was given through Moses, and yet something better, so as to complete it, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So what you're going to see, and all that I'm going to tell you, says John, is going to be built on the foundation given to Moses. As God once dwelt, so now God has pitched his tabernacle with us again. As God once created in the beginning, so now we're at the moment of creation, as we'll see in the Passion and so on. So John is deeply grafting all of this into the Old Testament imagery. With that in mind, let's look at the bread of life. So, as you know, this is a long monologue in chapter 6. Let me just point to this little section. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. I'm not going to crack that open, but of course John is, Christ is doing the same thing that Paul just did. Not just pointing to a surface level correspondence, but saying, listen, the food which you need so as to sustain you in your pilgrimage towards what was promised is now offered again. Right, so it's this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Okay, there are two things that get alluded to in the, the bread of life discourse. Things from the Old Testament that are deeply informative of what Christ is saying here. In the Bread of Life discourse, so one of them is going to be the wisdom tradition, and one of them is going to be the Passover meal. In the Bread of Life discourse, there is uh, this kind of a middle point. Um, his interlocutors, his fellow Jews, are responding, how, you know, how can this be, right? And Christ doesn't sort of back down and say, well, no, I just mean this figuratively. He actually doubles down in the, in the Greek, because there are two different words for, for eat that are used in chapter 6. One is, uh, so one Greek word for eat is esthil, or the past tense is phagomai. You probably know this from esophagus, right? Or even more depressingly, or depressingly, sarcophagus, which just means flesh eater. Sarx is, fl is flesh, and phagomai is to eat. It's because, by the way, digression. 
A sarcophagus is where you buried someone, obviously, uh, who had just died, and then usually covered with lime or something of that sort to reduce them to bones. And then you would gather the bones and put them in an ossuary, I'm sort of in a family tomb. So sometimes when you hear the Old Testament say, he or she would, were, were gathered unto their fathers. There's a little bit of literal meaning to that, right? So here is the box where the flesh is eaten away, sarcophagus. Anyway, um, that first word to eat, phagomai, has kind of a broad range of meaning like our word eat or devour has. Like, how's that book? I'm just, I'm devouring it, right? Like, I know what you mean. You're not eating the book, right? So eat in the, in the larger sense of just take in, assimilate. When around, around verse 52, I think it is, Christ is pressed like, do you really mean what you're saying? He then turns to the Greek word trogo, which is to gnaw. Or to, it's what animals do to their food. There's nothing metaphorical about it. It's you must actually eat, right? And even an exegete like Rudolf Boltmann, who's not a, not a Catholic exegete, a Lutheran, um, says this is very clearly a Eucharistic reference. Um, this is a reference to the early shape of the Christian liturgy where you received Christ first according to the memoirs of the apostles, as Justin Martyr says, Liturgy of the Word, where you assimilate Christ in a more metaphorical way. I'm devouring this book. And then to the, the reception of Christ in a more, pick your word, robust, literal, substantial way. How about that? In the Liturgy of the Eucharist. So that division, Liturgy of the Word, Liturgy of the Eucharist, is present. And John, in presenting, or Christ in making the Bread of Life discourse, is alluding to these two realities in the Old Testament. Here's what I mean. The first one would be, in the wisdom tradition, uh, here's a, from chapter 9 in Proverbs, Lady Wisdom will speak of herself, I'm saying, come to me, eat of, start in verse 5, come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed, leave simpleness and live, walk in the way of insight. That's all you need. Wisdom refers to the reception of herself with the language of eating. Come and eat of this wisdom. Christ does the same thing in the first half of the bread of life. So this is also a type of the Eucharist. And then the second half, when Christ is referring more, more substantially to the, to the gnaw, to the eat, what is he referencing? But the Passover lamb. Right? The manna, which has to be, of course, eaten, and also the Passover lamb. Um, why, the, why the Passover lamb? I asked one of my students yesterday, I said, you know, I don't understand, I don't understand the Eucharist at all because it's, it's our gift, it's a gift to God, right? But then I eat it. And like last time I brought my wife a box of chocolates and ate it on the way, it's not a very good <laughs> gift, right? Like, so, so how, does, how does that work, right? And what you see is that the, the consumption of sacrifice in the Old Testament identifies you with the sacrifice. So think of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12. It's the Passover lamb's blood, not yours, that keeps away the angel of death. But by you eating the Passover lamb, which is a, which is a requirement of that sacrifice, you identify with that lamb such that its blood is as, though, is, is as your own, right? So in the Eucharist, yes, we offer to you yours of your own, um, as it says in the Liturgy of John Chrysostom. We're offering, we're representing the sacrifice of Christ, but by our consumption of it, we're including ourselves in that offering, right? I eat the gift precisely to as to, so as to enrich the gift given to God, to include not only Christ, but his whole body as well, namely all of us, right? So in this Bread of Life discourse, Christ is inviting us to receive him, as was spoken of in wisdom in the Old Testament, as was spoken of in the Passover lamb. You need to receive what I teach, and you need to be joined to me. That's the summary of chapter 6. You need to receive what I teach, and you need to be joined with me, such that my life is yours. Right? So again, you see the way in which these, these references to the old in John 6 are functioning not as some sort of surface level of just details, but inviting us into a whole way of understanding the world that the Old Testament provides. Proverbs. I'll do one more from John because it's so lovely and because I, we've already sort of laid the groundwork in, uh, in talking about the, the burning bush. 
the first paragraph there, that's the, um, some of the details that are brought up in Psalm 22 about, you know, for my clothing they have cast lots and so on, not tearing the garment. Let's look at the second paragraph there. Since it was the day of preparation in order pre to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Just hold that. So think back to what we said about Eden, burning bush, menorah, tabernacle, temple, Gihon, river coming out of the temple. Here's the new Eden from which the source of all blessings flow. When the prophet Ezekiel, at the end of his vision during the exile, um, has this vision of, of the renewed temple or the heavenly temple, what he sees, and I'll read this quickly, is basically water gushing forth from the side of the temple. You know where this is going, but let's look for it. So then he, my guide, brought me to the door of the temple, and behold, the water was issuing from below the, th the threshold. And as he follows the water outside, it gets deeper and deeper. Skip to verse 6. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me along the bank of the river, and as I, and as I went back, I saw upon the bank of the river very many trees on one side and on the other. So what the temple is, Eden, is now it's expanding outward, right? It's making an Eden of all the rest. Uh, I saw many I saw upon the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other, verse 8, and he said to me, this water flows to the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, and when it flows, it enters the stagnant waters of the sea, the Dead Sea, right? So the, so the quintessential place of not life. Um, the waters reach even there. So fundamentally what Ezekiel is seeing is the temple, and the temple somehow opening itself and extending its own body, you know, <laughs> um, so as to fructify the entire, the entire earth. And when you have Christ on the cross in John, providentially this is what happens to Christ, where his side is open. Christ too in John 2 refers to himself as, he referred not to the temple, to the temple of his body, right? In, the, in John 2 teens, 2.17 to 19. Um, so Christ who is the new temple is opened so as to be the source of fructification. And of course, in the tradition we identify the blood and the water as the blood of so the water of baptism and the blood of the Eucharist. So like, this is perhaps the best example where you might, you probably wouldn't catch this as, a, as referring to any types in the Old Testament unless you had in mind that whole narrative of Eden, Theophany, burning bush, menorah, tabernacle, temple, Gihon, and so on. But it's only when you have that larger matrix, that whole sort of imaginative I say imaginative, not as though it's fiction, but the whole sort of world of, of images that the Old Testament provides. It's only when you have that in mind that something like this event of the piercing of Christ's side really takes on a whole, a whole deeper meaning. It's very beautiful. All right. So these are individual moments. Um, the last one I was going to give is just Christ as Passover lamb. That's kind of an obvious one. John the Baptist referring to Christ as the sacrifice which delivers not from Egypt, but from actual death, and so on. All right, before we get to the creation account, um, where have we come so far? We've said, given that the whole of history is a providentially structured narrative, God authors the whole. Of course it's the case that what eventually comes to be sort of percolates or shows itself, you know, comes to the surface, um, in earlier moments. We looked at Paul in Corinthians, we looked at a couple places in John, and we saw that those texts refer back to moments in the old, not just because there are moments of similarity in outward details, but because what happens in Christ carries forward the entire narrative of the old. It invi they invite us, Paul and John invite us, to go back and to consider more deeply all of these texts and places in the Old Testament where we can find a richer understanding of the Eucharist. And I made the claim in my opening paragraph that the whole of history is Eucharistic in shape. So in the little time that remains, um, here's what I mean by that. I want to look at Genesis 1, uh, 
and then one or two other places. This, of course, is day six. Famous lines, wait, sp don't read it. No, I don't want to ask you. I do this to my freshmen. I say, what is very good in creation? They all say, the human person. I say, wrong. Um, it's the whole. God looks at everything that he has made. And it's only the whole that is judged very good. It's interesting. The things that by themselves were good, 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 when viewed as a completed whole, are judged to be very good. There's a lot there to think about. Not today. Anyway. Um, of course, this is the opening chapter of scripture and the opening statement about the role, the identity and the function of the human person. And when Genesis alerts us to this fact that we are made in the image and likeness of God, what does it mean to say? In Hebrew, the idea of the image and likeness have to do with one's being a vicar or an envoy. So namely, of who are we a vicar, an envoy? God. And well, your job as a vicar is to do what God has been doing. What has God been doing in Genesis 1? Making stuff and separating or ordering stuff. Genesis 1 isn't just making. Notice that on every day there's the waters above the heavens from the waters below, the light from the darkness, the sea from the dry land, each of the animals or plants according to their kind, right? There's always an ordering. So the human person is tasked fundamentally with this role of making stuff and of ordering stuff, which gets summarized. Um, let us make man our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the everything. Notice that dominion is the one mentioned first and then you have be fruitful and have dominion. The, the dominant note in the creation account is not on the making of things, but on the right ordering of things. So yes, have dominion. Yes, yes, make stuff and have dominion, is what the sixth day says. And what does it mean to exercise dominion? Well, if you say, in what way has God exercised dominion in Genesis 1? Has he been a good steward? Well, not only has he drawn things into being, but he has moved everything toward the Sabbath rest. So fundamentally, the task of the human person is to move everything toward the Sabbath rest. And what is the Sabbath rest? Um, it's, it, and it takes what form? What? Yeah, Eucharist, right? It takes, and like my, some of my students, they can't reconcile this. What, is, what do you mean rest is worship? And you don't need this example, but I'll give it anyway. Um, I say, think of it a natural example. If you're standing before the you know, Grand Teton National Park or something, you are in what you are. This is a properly speaking ecstatic moment where you're so sort of outside of yourself and enraptured by the other. In this case, it happens to be in mountains, right? And you just you kind of say something like, "Whoa!" Okay, that's worship in a nutshell. Being beholden by the other, or this ecstatic moment of being just taken by the other and acknowledging the other for what it is. Okay, that's, and you know in a moment like that where you're just enraptured with beauty, it's a restful moment. And it's a moment that's entirely directed toward the other. It's restful and it's worshipful, right? And so, yeah. <clears throat> this might, it's kind of thinking of that in another way. I read where putting um, the bow in the sky after mm. you know, the, the story of Noah, that in the ancient times, when you come back from the hunt, you hang up your bow, <coughs> and it's time to enjoy the feast. Oh, so it's like wow. you've done all this work, and now it's when you gather together and you enjoy what you've done with each other. You rest and you enjoy. And I love thinking of that as kind of like worship. It's like we come together, we get, we tell the story, we you know eat the food, it, <laughs> and uh, hang up the bow. <laughs> yeah, I never heard. Thank you. I never heard that about the bow. I I like that. Um, but let me. I'm going to jump off right from there. So no, so the, the human's vocation is to order all things to rest and to Sabbath. What form does that take? According to the Old Testament, it's exactly what Alicia just said. It's, Alicia, sorry. Um, it's, it's eating. So, so, yeah, I know this is a long one, sorry. Uh, but just bear with me for a moment because it, sacrifice in the Old Testament is really confusing. Here is my in a nutshell um, summary. Sorry, there's a gratuitous saint at the end there, never mind. 
Okay, speaking broadly, Israel too has a share in this meal. Just read, just, it'll become clear. Um, here are the types of sacrifice in the Old Testament. Purification and reparation, so the um, hatat and the asham sacrifices, offerings, are what I call the getting dressed for church, or the like, mea culpa, the rite of contrition, um, not, the, what do you, not the rite of contrition, what you, uh, the what? Penitential act. Penitential act, yeah. At the beginning, it's, you're, you're getting ready, right? So getting rid of impurity and of incidental sin. Um, our preparatory in nature. Their consumption is not meant as a means of table fellowship with the altar. And the altar in this temple, any temple in the ancient Near East, represents the God. Of the principal sacrifices, the burnt offering, the olah, the holocaust offering, is given entirely over to the altar. God gets the whole thing. While the grain offering is consumed by the altar and by the priest, but not by you. The last, the peace offering, the shalamim, or the shalom offering, is unique in that it, it is to be consumed not only by the altar, which is to say by God and the priest, but by the one who brings the offering. Sorry, I had a cut and paste. I have some extra dashes there. And the meal of the shalamim's owner is not based on God's bestowing part of the sacrifice upon him, as is true of the priest. From the beginning in the shalamim sacrifice, the peace sacrifice, the table is set for two, for God and for the owners, two equal partners fully participating in the meal. It's a rabbinic commentary. Though it is not a component of any feast or regular obligation of Israel, <coughs> and perhaps because it is not, so the shalamim is never something prescribed for Israel to do, there is reason to consider the peace offering as the central or the most important form of worship in the Old Testament. It's something not done out of obligation. It's the free, freely made sacrifice. It presumes what the other sacrifices achieve, namely that you have the purification taken care of and sin taken care of and you've paid your debts with the Holocaust sacrifice and all that. It presumes what the other sacrifices achieve, namely preparedness of the people and of the sanctuary. And it is offered not by obligation but by freely. It is an occasion of free and intimate table fellowship between Israel and her God. So again, the fundamental human task of exercising dominion, of moving things toward the Sabbath rest, how does that actually manifest itself in Israel's life? We have all these sacrifices, but the central one I'm claiming is the shalamim, the one where you and God share table. And here's how the shalamim works. If we in Thanksgiving for the symposium decide to make journey, you know, make pilgrimage to Jerusalem, we go up uh, and we bring with us a couple sheep, okay, a couple sheep, and we sacrifice them in the temple, we have to consume the sheep it's within, you know, 24 hours more or less in the temple together. So part of it goes on the altar and we all have to eat the rest. It has to be shared there in the temple with God right then and there. That's the culminating point of Israel's worship. That's the rest in the worship the repose that, towards which everything is tending. One way to summarize that, a um, quote from Alexander Schmemann, the great uh, Orthodox theologian of last century, is this, and we're hitting our conclusion point here. The first and basic definition of man is that he is the priest. He stands in the center of the world and unifies it. Think of the very good of day six. And unifies it in his act of blessing, in his act of blessing God of both receiving the world from God and offering it to God. And by filling the world with this Eucharist, this Thanksgiving, he transforms his life, the one he receives from the world, into life in God, into communion with God. The world was created as the matter, the material, of one all-embracing Eucharist. And the human person, man, was created as the priest of this cosmic sacrament. That's his way of saying that human person's role is just to gather in and to offer back. Where this comes to a head, and this is the last quote, <coughs> although it's a, <coughs> a difficult one, where this comes to a head is, of course, in the Eucharist. And here's what Rowan Williams has to say about the Eucharist, the old Archbishop of Canterbury, not the current one, but the, the previous. It's a tough quote. The human life of Jesus <coughs> is a performance of the life of the eternal word, a perpetual exemplification of what it is to be affiliated with the Father, a performance of the divine life in the conditions of this world. Okay, here's a really crappy analogy. Um, aren't you excited? <laughs> That's a great lead-in, yeah. <laughs> bring it on, bring it on. Um, 
So I, I'm, I'm married, my wife is Katie, I'm, you know, we do nice things for each other, right? If I all of a sudden were to, sh to show up, if I had to like go to Belize or somewhere, the nice things that I'm already doing for Katie would all of a sudden begin to draw in uh, new, new material, new plants, new forms of gift, new forms of artwork from Belize, right? So like there's this love that already exists between us, but now I set foot in Belize. I have Belize in mind because I lived there for a little while. Um, so now I might start sending her like, I don't know, I don't know, what do you, what do you send home from Belize? Marie Sharp's hot sauce, you know. <laughs> um, or I might, you know, a picture of the Caribbean, wish you were here. <laughs> Maybe that's not nice. Maybe that's mean, I should say. But the point, the point is this, that my love precedes my, my arrival in Belize. But once I arrive there, I begin drawing into that exchange of love the things around me. So what you can think of, and I know this has got the great analogy, is that there's an eternal relation between the Father and the Son, this relation of love. And what the incarnation does, it's, it's Christ showing up in Belize, as it were. Where now he draws into that existing relationship of love, things created, his own humanity, those around him, right? He begins to draw in, he stands, as Shemaiman says, at the center of creation, and makes of that creation a Eucharist, an offering back to the Father. So Christ, in, in the Gospel of John, can speak of his own mission as, I come to not to do my will, but to the will of the one who sent me. So I receive everything from the Father, and here... I lose none of the ones you have given me, but I offer them all back up to you. Right? So you have this reception and response. Christ gathering in and offering back. And so that fundamental vocation of the human person that we see already in Genesis, to receive creation and to lead it into the act of worship, to lead it into rest, Christ just does that perfectly in his own self-offering. And in the Eucharist, we're able to, as I said, draw ourselves and the whole of creation into that self-offering as well. The point being, I know it's like a quick run through the whole of scripture, but the point is that what is achieved in the Eucharist, namely perfect receptivity and perfect love and response, has been the charge of the human person from the beginning and has been realized in many and various ways along the way in Melchizedek, in the manna, in the, ta the, the temple worship and so on, such that when the Eucharist is instituted, it's nothing other than the culmination, the drawing in, the recapitulation, to use Irenaeus' term, of the whole of that history which has come before. If the New Testament, if the liturgy, if the fathers of the church point us to specific moments of correspondence, hey Melchizedek, hey uh, man in the wilderness, the point of their doing so is to invite us to consider the whole narrative, which is itself, as a whole, a type of what takes place in the Eucharist. Okay, that's cool. Sorry. Thanks. We have some time for questions. Hey, please. Thanks. John 10 might fit in some of this because that free offering that I'm sorry I already forgot the word he used. Um, Shalamim. Yes. Yeah. John 10 he says, No one takes my life from me, I lay it down freely. I have, yeah. Right? I mean, that's echoing towards that type of sacrifice, right? But also, even in that moment, and I'm not sure if this is connected, he's also looking at, or what they would have heard Ezekiel 34 in that whole moment. Mm -hmm. So when, in Ezekiel 34, when it talks about the covenant of peace, is that related to this sacrifice as well? I wish it were. That would be a great... Huh? Um, oh, yeah, that uh, would be so cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, sort of the, so the covenant of peace is distinct from the specific uh, Sinaitic, you know, Mosaic covenant, which is a formal agreement. A covenant of peace, um, or a barit olam, you know, everlasting covenant, is a most people interpret it as a more generic agreement of, kind of like Noah would be a covenant of peace, right? Um, there's, there's, again, I wish there were a connection between the Shalemim sacrifices, which are proper to the, Noah, the covenant with Moses, and this general notion of a covenant of peace. But at least in the Old Testament, that connection is not, not I mean, there. What I'm connecting, I think what I'm trying to connect okay. is that restful worship. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, thank you for this. I mean, that's yeah, and okay. um, 
Rabbi Freeman is very definite that the Mosaic Covenant is not ours as Christians. It's and, not. And, you know, and, which yeah. is right, you know. And so if we try and conflate them, I think we're doing a disservice. However, we have we rest in the covenant, which is set in Genesis, you know. Yeah, oh, this is a big can of um, <clears throat> So part of the argument of the letter to the Hebrews and of Paul, of course, is to anchor what happens in Christ in things that are prior to Moses, right? In Abraham, who was justified by faith, or in the letter to the Hebrews, to the sacrifice of Melchizedek, and so on. Um, in making that connection, I think one thing is happening, one thing is not happening. Here's what I mean. Uh, what's not happening is this. Paul and Hebrews in the New Testament are not saying, something has happened in Christ, which is fundamentally unrelated to the, the Sinaitic covenant, right? Uh, no. I mean, Christ is a Passover sacrifice. Christ is a Jew. He was born under the law, as it says in, in, in Galatians and so on. So it has to be a continuance of, of the specifically Jewish story. But then the question of how do the Gentiles fit in? Because we don't become Jews under the, or we don't become Jews in the sense of those under the law of Moses, right? Well, hmm. What is the, the identity and the function of Israel in the Old, in the Old Testament? Uh, the fir, in, in the beginning of, of Genesis 12, when you have this initial set of promises given to Abraham, it's not just the promise of land and progeny, but the promise that Israel will somehow be a source of blessing to all the nations. Or think of Isaiah 2, in the latter days, the mountain of the Lord shall be raised high, and the nations will stream towards it, and so on, right? That Israel's role was to be, um, the, Terence Freitham in his commentary in Genesis says that the tabernacle in the wilderness was um, the, the world as it ought to be writ small within Israel. That post-fall, what should have been the case universally for the whole, now has to be reestablished in one family. But the, the identity and the function of this one privileged elect family is that eventually its side be pierced and it fructify the whole earth, right? And so the story of Christ has to be one that is deeply anchored in the Jewish narrative, but that succeeds in fructifying the whole earth, not by making everybody Jews, but by restoring what the whole of creation was in position to be from the beginning. Um, so, here's, here's what I mean. Um, when Christ says in Matthew 5.17, that I've come not to, think not that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Christ doesn't mean, hey, I will make you all obedient to the Torah of Moses. All of you, all you Gentiles, I'll make you all obedient. What he means to say is that very reality which the, the covenant with Moses meant to foster in creation, namely, loving receptivity and response, I now completely exemplify. I'm who am one who receives everything and offers everything from God. So in that sense, I'm the fulfillment of the law, and by myself being the fulfillment of the law, as Paul says, make obsolete the law. So it's both an anchoring and a, a, a shucking of the law at the same time. So yeah, we're not Jews, and Jews are right to keep their covenant and are beautiful, and God bless them for doing it. Uh, but our identity is not as Jews. I, I don't know, my, have I dealt with your concern at all, or am I saying something you disagree with? No, Please let me know. You have dealt very well with my concern. Okay. Did, did, am I, have I heard yeah, you right? Or, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, was, I was just, I mean, it struck me very much about, I, I lay it down freely, I have the power to lay it down and take it up again, that that was all, mm. that, that adds for me so much more to his sacrifice and what that means yeah. Yeah. In, in light of what we celebrate, receive. And, and I'm gonna, can I edit my answer? We can edit this. Right. Um, the, the fact that the covenant of peace isn't necessarily connected with shalomim sacrifice doesn't work against your point at all because 
what you, what you see in Christ is the convergence of fundamentally distinct things in the Old Testament. A slide that I didn't get to do, and it's, uh, well, real quick, Psalm 51, David's contrite psalm, um, start in verse 15, or 16. You have no delight in sacrifice were I to give you a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And it sounds like that's it. Just, just the internal directedness towards God and contrition and praise. And then what does David say in like this giant seem or apparent contradiction? Do good design and thy pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifice. You're like, David, you, ju you just said, you ju read your paper, right? Um, <laughs> then you'll delight. And, and the way that Ratzinger deals with this is say, there's this fundamental tension in the Old Testament between the, the the knowledge that what God most desires is the full and entire gift of you. But what the Old Testament cult makes possible is a gift given wholly and entirely. You can't get the pig back out of the sausage. Not that that's the best analogy for Old Testament sacrifice. But like, there's a permanence and irrevocability to the sacrifice. And so David is saying, like, I know it's me you want, but you're going to be pleased with the sacrifice if I have the right disposition. But it's only in the eventual convergence of priest and victim Right? So the fact that you have covenant of peace and shalomim and these other strands that do come together in Christ, I mean, that's great. They don't have to be already unified in the old. So, so make that connection. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. And we can just go sit in silence. Do, do you want me to, I'll stop talking. No, no. <laughs> I get you. I get you. That's fine. No, that's no, cool. No, you feel better. I'll ask you another, ask like you another question about the bush. Yeah, okay. Because I know it's not going to work. I know you can't answer it, but I'm asking you. Thanks. So, <laughs> so, with that translation, can we move that into the parable of the mustard seed when he's talking about it goes into a bush? Different languages, right? So, we're not going to be able to make that comparison? Um, I mean, the parable of the mustard seed has to function metaphor. I mean, it's not right, right, the right. smallest seed and it's not the biggest tree. It to the tree. <laughs> right. Or to the garden. So that's a whole other thing, y'all. I actually need to make sure I need to go work tomorrow because I'm going to have to do that. But I don't know if that works with the language because they're different um, languages, right? They would have been written, those books were written in different languages. So can you compare? Yeah, I don't know the, the Greek word for, for bush in Exodus 3 offhand. But I mean, I'll, I'll say this. The connection that that Sene and Sinai means to make is that, um, listen, what goes forth from the temple is instruction, right? So Torah is nothing other than the derivative of God's presence. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, okay, so in the more orthodox side, you'd say every least letter of the Torah is actually articulated and copied down at Sinai. And in, in kind of the other extreme, um, it, uh, people like Heschel would say, no, all that's revealed at Sinai is God's presence, is as it were the burning bush. And it's the function of Moses who, to articulate the, the um, sort of the concept or the correlative of that, the con how we respond to that, right? And so th it's from the presence of the burning bush, the whole of wisdom, the whole of instruction is derived. And that does provide a home and a for, for the whole world, right? And so uh, you, I think you can make that connection with the mustard seed. You can make that connection also with the, 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 the tree. I mean, the cross is the burning tree, right? I mean, um, but that's what we have. So yeah, make, I think you can make that connection, even if the, the language isn't, isn't there. But I got to look it up, so yeah. Um, my question is, is maybe what we're going to be doing this afternoon, which is how do you do this with people? and, and at some level, you can, but so much of it depends on, I mean, so many of your images depended on, okay, you have to go back to the original Hebrew here or the original Greek here to see the resonance. And I, you know, I start to see, I have a, I have a parishioner who's working on a doctorate in, in religion, and, and she's of the mind that, that uh, we shouldn't have translations of the Bible. We sh everyone should learn Greek Good and luck. Hebrew. Because, I mean, I, yeah. you know what she's, she's saying. I mean, yeah. she's not, and she knows it's not a, you know, it's, she, she's not a crusader for this or anything, but she's, she's making a point, and that is so much of it kind of depends on what you can see in the Greek and the, in the, in the Hebrew, the, those connections that are being made that are... Um, I, it, so I just, you know, how... I, or, or can you just make these connections between, oh, well, this says Bush and that says Bush, so we can go ahead and, in English and make this connection that could lead, lead to interesting but possibly erroneous 
I don't know. I, I just, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to like stake your exegesis on the convergence of two English words because who knows what the translator did. I mean, she might have been done that one and someone else did that one. You know, the, um, I mean, the reason in my talk I said, you know, sometimes it's the case that the, you know, the Greek matters. I, I, I don't like, you know, when every sermon begins, well, in the Greek it says. Like, well, in the Greek it says exactly what it says in the English most of the time. And they, with, with a couple exceptions, I mean, like, so the Sinai, Sinai thing in, in the bush, like, you can only see that in the original, right? Um, I believe the, or not believe, most of the correspondences are not at the level of, of, of sort of lexicology. They're at the level of, of image. So even if you didn't, even if you didn't know uh, that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us was in the word pitched his tent. You could say, well, all right, look at Exodus 25, 8, make me a tabernacle so that I might dwell with you. Oh, and then the God comes to dwell with you. I mean, you, there are grounds for making these connections without needing to go 10 years into studying Semitic languages. And praise God, that's the case, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, but, but I say that with a little caveat that, of course, it's the case that sometimes the original is going to be fruitful in a way that a translation isn't. We still need the experts to help eliminate those. Yeah, or why it's fruitful to read different, like when I taught New Testament semester, I had all my students read David Bentley Hart's version of the New Testament, which is really clunky and literal, but it, it's revelatory because it defamiliarizes the text and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. Huh. Um, so like, now we, yeah. reading different translations helps a lot, but I mean, we don't all need to learn Greek and Hebrew. Good on you if you do, but you do not need to know Greek and Hebrew. We save you that trouble. So. I was sort of, uh, going even more primitive than Darren's question, um, thinking about the sort of generally low levels of kind of biblical familiarity and, um, and uh, his question of sort of how do we do this, it's the same question, but it's starting from uh, how, do you, how do you think about starting to impart the whole narrative differently, much less on the sort of uh, referential level that, that all this requires? Like, um, I mean, don't I, do I the death march through the Bible. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Don't start with for the rabbis and for Origen, Genesis one is the last thing you read. It's like the the throne chariot in Ezekiel. Don't touch it. Don't touch it, because to read some of these early and really theologically dense texts with really young kids is to invite them to sort of a literal and fundamentalist reading. And so, like I know in Good Shepherd, like you don't start with Genesis one. <laughs> For my daughter at St. Matt's, I, I do like St. Matt's. Thank you for teaching my daughter. Um, but she comes home with little like Adam and Eve, little eaten, eaten from the apple. And like, the, she's a fundamentalist in training. And, um, that's not an answer. The answer is I don't know. Like I know how to deal with and it just freshmen and, last and time, sophomores. Right? Like, it's and, not about it's not about a new technique. It's not about the best part. But it's there's a ten, I'm, since I feel a tension between like this is great and it's beautiful and I want our people to know how beautiful it is, and also, I don't know. Um, so let me preface my answer with, I have no idea. Uh, but one of the things that I'm coming to realize, and maybe Tim talked about this yesterday, is uh, develop, uh, cultivating actual practices of the faith are what give you the space to eventually think more deeply about them, right? Intellect, Christianity is not, first and foremost, an intellectual proposition. It's an encounter with the other, right? With God and the person of Christ. And you know, um, as Ratzinger says at the beginning of Deus Caritas Est, right? And if I think even just about like my own relationship with my wife, I mean, I'm, first I'm enraptured, and then I come to know more deeply here, right? And so I think probably the best thing that I can do for my kids, and I don't know if this is at all true of what you do, and I don't have, I don't, you do it all, I, I don't do this, so I don't know. Um, but when I think about my own kids, I think I want to give them a set of practices. So whether it's night prayer, something is genuflection, or it actually just the, the sign of the cross, or little habits of fasting, or giving up something during Lent. I was raised in like a nominally Catholic family. I knew nothing. But I remember my father giving up things for Lent. I remember, you know, the, the, and that sort of, that muscle memory, that spiritual muscle memory is what, for me, was the context 
or what gave me, sort of anchored me and gave me the space to eventually find some of the things that you and I now see in the scriptures. I don't, I just think that's somewhere in the mix. I don't know, that's not an answer, but sorry, you've, you've been waiting, sir. When you start talking about types and, and the typology in the Bible being a, um, basically everything points to Eucharist because that was what the whole thing is about, right? I just all of a sudden thought about the heavens are telling the glory of God and how we have found in science that there's this like fingerprint of God in the golden ratio and there are things that we see repeated everywhere. You know, it's the, the cosmos swirls and the sunflower swirl and, you know, the shell of a, a mollusk or whatever. Like, there's all these ways that I think point us to the parable method of like look at what's around you experience essential realities, and that is the first catechesis to then have the ABCs for how to understand this, which is further along. It's like you first teach the first sound so that you can read anything and understand mm -hmm. wherever the spirit leads you, but first you have to have the, 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 I don't know, like I keep thinking, like if we give our children opportunities to break bread together and prepare a meal, I remember seeing the catechesis for the zero to three year olds, mm -hmm brought down to its most essentials. It was so beautiful. It's like, okay, light, planting seeds, getting in the dirt. And, it, and that's what Jesus does. He goes to the most simple people and talks about their experience of reality, which has the story of God's love in it because it was created by that love. So his fingerprints are everywhere. We can just help people see the signs. Yeah, when you, sp when you speak about the book of, you know, the book of nature, right, um, there's, there's a lot of ways to read that. Uh, one of the ways that I found really effective for the age group that I deal with is um, we read this little account of the, the Carmelite martyrs of, um, in France in the French, Revo uh, French Revolution. And as they were going one by one, all 13 of them, I think it was, going to the guillotine, they were, they were singing the Psalms of today, you know, his mercy is confirmed upon us. And I was like, what crazy people, you know. Uh, and I, and I say to them, have you ever been in love? Um, say, what's one of the hardest things to do when you're in love? It's to adequately communicate to the beloved your love, right? Like, you, you, can, you can never quite find the words or the gesture, right? And I said, the reason that these, these Carmelite nuns were, were praising God for his mercy at the moment of going to the guillotine is, here in God's providence, they were being given the opportunity to speak eloquently with the whole of their flesh, the whole, with their whole life, right? To, to proclaim a fidelity and a love and a witness in a way that wasn't yesterday available to them, right? I say one of the ways that we can like begin to think about the Eucharist is it's, it's, it's a form of eloquence. And it's, it's, uh, it's giving you a vocabulary to do what it is you already desire to do, right? Which is to to say thank you and to say I love you to others and once you get to know God, God. I mean, point being that, yeah, I think Book of Nature is a great place to again, begin because grace presupposes and builds on all of this and capitalizes on our natural desires. Um, and what that means in like nuts and bolts of where you start, I don't know. So I'm just going to keep saying to your question, I don't know. But yeah, so, that's it. I would just say that um, the uh, Catechism of the Shepherd, which goes up through age 12, by the time when you get to the 9 to 12 year old, you're actually doing the Old Testament, five major narratives in the Old Testament and typology with them. I don't know if you're aware of that, but... Not yet. Yeah. And um, so I would say that's a good place to, to search. If, but you do start with the littlest ones because that's when you're falling in love with God. And you only stick with the New Testament except for several prophecies until they're nine um, mm. because of that growing encounter with, with the Lord Jesus. And, um, and it's rooted in the Bible liturgy. But this, this had me in tears because coming out of that tradition, I was just like, <sighs> you know, so I was just like having that experience of all and wondering and listening to this. So thank you. Okay. But I will just say that. Um, that would be. Yeah. I, and just to add one little thing to that. Um, it's, it's traditional in Jewish tradition that the first book of the Bible that children read is Leviticus. It's not the real page turner. But the reason is, is that before you begin to speculate about God and learn about this, you just you learn what you do, right? And I, I, was, I was listening to the silver chair the other day, you know, Narnia. And there's this, sorry if you don't know the silver chair, but I know some of you do. 
there's this scene where they're in the underworld and they're trying to rescue this figure who turns out to be Prince Rillian, right? And Aslan, the Jesus figure, has, has said to, to Lucy and, um, uh, yeah, Polly, no, Lucy and Digger, uh, uh, Paul, Paul and, uh, Eustace, yeah. and Eustace, Polly uh, and Eustace, he said, you know, the one who invokes my name, like trust that one or something like that, that's the sign that he gave them. And this mad Prince Rillian, who's actually the Prince of Narnia, um, who's possessed and unrecognizable, and he's screaming, and he's, he, he eventually swears in the name of Aslan. And, and uh, uh, sorry, Jill and, and Eustace don't want to trust him. And Puddleglum, uh, who's, you know, this, mm. we know some Puddleglums. Uh, uh, <laughs> Puddleglum just says, Aslan didn't say what would happen. He just said what to do, right? And like the first thing is just obedience to the command because the obedience to the command is already an enfleshed form of understanding. And so like, just read Leviticus. I, we'll talk about it later. This is what you do. Just genuflect, just make the sign of the cross, just, we're, yeah, I know it's boring, we're gonna show up every Sunday, you know, but that kind of, um, and the way that that actually opens to the reading of, of the Old Testament later on. But, uh, yeah, so that was a bit of, Carolyn's gonna give me the, the stuff. One more question. Yeah. Yeah, hey. Oh. Can you, uh, as you were talking, <coughs> I was linking this to Chauvet's sacramental theology in terms of ignorance. Are you familiar okay. with I'm this? I'm not, part? I'm sorry, but, okay. but no. Yeah, because he says. Ignorance is no it, obstacle, I'll talk. <laughs> yes. He takes this yeah. covenant relationship of giving of God to us uh, within the Eucharist, and then that. that breathing relationship of, of God giving and us giving back. And he says, we cannot give back to God what God has given to us. We can only give to others. And that is what we are called to do. And I was just thinking that linking, this is what you do. And this is what Jesus said to you. It's, it's that total self-giving to other, where where we realize our Eucharistic thing. Yeah. Um, sort of. If I can critique Chauvet, no. Um, I mean, one thought to add to that. Uh, love, of, love of God and love of neighbor are fundamentally in, inseparable because love of God is, I'm sorry, love of neighbor is love of God, right? Like you can't profess your allegiance to me and punch my daughter in the face. You, you can't hate the things that I love and say that you love me, right? And since God has, I mean, you're not, I mean, not that you're saying this, but even in the Old Testament, you're, you're not literally feeding God, right? I mean, and so there comes to be this equivalence between, and Gary Anderson here has pointed to this out in his, his writing, he's our Old Testament, one of our Old Testament professors. Um, there's this long-running equivalence between uh, alms and, and uh service, I mean like temple service, uh, Matthew 25 style, uh, precisely because the, the neighbor is the beloved, and that's where God's need is actually present. So to offer the Eucharist, I mean th th that little kind of funny paradox I mentioned before about offering the chocolates and eating them along the way, I mean that dynamic, that dynamic you're mentioning, you see it there because Precisely to give to God is actually to distribute to others. Um, that somehow that, that's a convergence and not a divergence, right? But and see, that's yeah. so cute. Uh, talks about it too. Like, like it, in the like it's just right there. You know, like, if we are to look on, we, we are in the womb of Christ coming up. Yeah, this is why, okay, I know, I know we're out of time. Sorry, I'm going to keep talking. Um, uh, Go back and read the uh, Genesis 32, the Jacob wrestling with the angel, right? And what's very clear at the end is it starts off as an ish guy in Hebrew, just the dude. Uh, and, but by the end, when Jacob says, I have seen the Lord face to face and I, my, you know, my life has been spared, and he names the place Peniel, which means face of God, it's clear that this has been a divine encounter. No, no questions about it. A divine encounter. And then, the, now if you remember, at this point in the narrative, Jacob is on his way to meet um, Esau, and he's scared, and he's sending everybody ahead of him to like, hey, here's some, here's some chocolates and fruit and things, right? And <laughs> here are some sheep. And, uh, but this is the night that falls 
sort of midway in that journey, and he meets Esau the next morning. And if you think about, okay, take seriously the wrestling for a minute. If it's actually the Lord with whom Jacob wrestles, who won the fight? <laughs> who leaves the fight injured? Jacob, not the guy. Who, uh, okay, Jacob gets blessed, but the name with which he gets blessed, Yisrael, means the Lord shall rule. And if to pronounce the name is actually to assert El's dominance. So I gave you the blessing, but I am El. And you know what? Yisrael. I will rule. That guy wins the fight. And I'm sorry, Hosea says, you know, the angel was overcome. Anyway, but you realize that he kind of lets, is what um, Simon Tugwell calls the omnipotent weakness of God, right? Like that in allowing himself to beat, be, be beaten by Jacob, he actually has his way with Jacob, right? And what's clear is that this is a, this is a divine figure whom, with whom he wrestles. And the next morning when he meets Esau and he falls upon Esau's neck, what does he say to Esau? Seeing you is like seeing the face of God. There's this like really heavy verbal connection right there. That, and there, there's this wonderful tradition that he wrestles Esau at the Jabbok. And not, and, but, but again, you're conflating the love of neighbor and the wrestling with neighbor and the wrestling with God. These things are all beautifully of a piece. Um, yeah, there's a lot there to think about. But again, your point of the conflating, not the conflating, but the emerging of God's identity and neighbor's identities. Okay, I'll shut up. So, right. But, uh, so, thanks.